At an age when most boys were out playing football or riding bikes, Waldo found his muse in a different calling. It was a calling that would make him one of the biggest stars of his day. But poor investments, family tragedy, and the specter of addiction turned this all-American boy's life into a living nightmare. Tonight, we look at Waldo, the man, the myth, and the legend. On a cool May morning in 1967, Waldo Dwayne Reynolds was born in the suburban sprawl of Hicksville, Long Island. The son of Smokey and the Bandit and Smokey and the Bandit 2 star Burt Reynolds, Waldo's single father made his only son's formative years austere. Family friend, Ned Beatty. Burt was quite the carouser in those days, and to be honest, we never really knew who Waldo's real mother was. Burt didn't like Waldo, really, at all. He made no bones about it. He was a man of principle, and once he decided that he didn't like the boy, well, that's just how it was going to be. Despite a rocky home life, Waldo found release and a way to express himself with his unique talent. John Plimpton remembers Waldo as a bit of a standout. When we were just 10 or 11, he'd always be saying, Hey guys, get up on the roof. And we'd say, how come? And he'd say, well, I'm going to go into the schoolyard. And we'd say... Well, how come? And he'd say, I'm going to get in with all the people. And we'd say, why do we have to go on the roof? And he'd say, oh, yeah, well, you're going to look for me. And then we'd all say, why? And he'd say, you know, to, to look for me with all the people around and the things. And we'd say, but why? After a while, he just stopped asking. But the young Waldo knew he had a talent for going into and then blending in with his surroundings, as seen here in this 1978 photo. But his dreams went well beyond the schoolyard. While a strong student and proud member of the local pottery club, Waldo longed for more than his tiny suburb offered. And like so many Long Island teens before him, he made the decision to move to the great urban mecca of Los Angeles. At the tender age of 17, Waldo Reynolds made what would be the biggest decision of his life. But the decision came at a steep price. A final nail into the coffin of his relationship with his father. Ned Beatty recalls. Bert never actually commented on it. I don't think it's because he was bitter uh, so much as he really didn't notice. You know, really. At all. Waldo Reynolds was out to conquer the world. But things did not get off to the booming start he had hoped for. While Waldo dreamed of getting lost in large crowds, for the time being it seemed as though the only thing he was getting lost in was the bump and shuffle of Hollywood. It seemed as if the burning candle of Waldo's dream was about to breathe its dying gasp. But then he got the break he had always dreamed of. Darry Aristopoulos had just been lured away from Highlights for Kids magazine by the then up-and-coming Scholastic Books. In the cutthroat world of children's publishing, Aristopolis was seen as a rising star and a man who thought out of the box. Aristopolis and Waldo hit it off immediately, and within weeks, Where's Waldo? Waldo's debut book hit bookshelves with a vengeance. 1987 would be remembered as the year of striped shirts and Coke bottle glasses. Waldo was living the high life, and moved to posh Manhattan digs with all the modern amenities of his day. Things continued to go well with the release of Fine Waldo Now and its follow-up, The Great Waldo Search. But despite the addition of a wizard to the look at me from up there while I'm down here with all these people but dressed in a different way equation, Waldo felt unfulfilled. The jet set life was beginning to bore him and he sought new and more interesting ways to enter a throng of people and be looked for. In 1991, the Gulf War reached its boiling point. Ever the Patriot, Waldo, like heartthrobs Elvis and Oliver Stone before him, enlisted. Waldo hoped to serve his country and perhaps even find exciting new crowd situations where he could enter and then be spotted by a keen analytical eye. Waldo came to find that war was not what he expected. On a patrol due south of the Iraqi city of Nazaria, Waldo's platoon was ambushed. When the smoke and sand had cleared, he would be the only survivor. Guilt over the advantage that his natural abilities had given him would haunt him for the rest of his days. 
Given his honorable discharge, Waldo returned home a changed man. Scholastic President Ronnie Pfeiffer. He would just stay in his apartment all day. It was as if he didn't want to go out and do, you know, well, his thing. In early 1993, after several new Waldo ventures failed to get off the ground, and in light of their star's increasingly erratic behavior, Aristopolis released Waldo from his scholastic contract. All ties were severed. Waldo began to spiral out of control. Kira Chestnut was a frequent companion of Waldo's during that dark time. He was doing a lot of drinking, lots of coke. Lots of coke. Too much, really. And there were always women. He didn't care what it cost, he just wanted to keep the party going. It was during this period that Waldo contacted scholastic arch-rivals Highlights for Children, with his sights set on a comeback. Highlights CEO Rodney Suge Knight was a rough character, with ties to drug rackets, gun smuggling, and baby sales. The hard-edged exec saw Waldo as a risk, but was still looking for a chance to stick it to his old boss, Dari Aristopoulos. But the match was not to be made in heaven. Perhaps the struggles of this period of Waldo's life are best represented in this audio tape recording of one of his frequent onset meltdowns. Do you even know who I am? Do you? I am Waldo fucking Reynolds, alright? Does that, does that ring a bell? You're trying to treat me like I'm Clifford the Big Red Bitch, and I'm not going to take it. Now say my name. Um, Waldo? Well, I'm Waldo goddamn Reynolds, alright? The only one bigger than me is Jesus, and he's already fucking dead. Waldo was an unmitigated failure at Highlights, and that did not sit well with the magazine's brain trust. When Fine Waldo at Noon on a Clear Day in a Temperate Climate on a Longshoreman's Wharf became the third Highlights book to flop, an agitated Suge Knight had had enough. Waldo was again released from his contract, but this time he would lose more than just his job. On the night of August 10th, 1995, Waldo was assaulted outside of a New York City parking garage by two Caucasian youths and suffered severe emotional and spinal damage. Police arrested two longtime Highlights employees, Gallant Reed and his cousin Peyton Goofus Slaughter, for questioning involved in the brutal beating. No charges were ever pressed. Waldo had been a prince among men, but at 27, he was broken, broke, and living life at an all-time low. Waldo recuperated from his physical woes in a local hospital, but the pain on his already fragile psyche seemed unhealable. Attempts to reunite with his father were met with a curt response. His career was over and depression set in. America didn't know where Waldo was, and it no longer cared. Then another blow. At the age of 54, Burt Reynolds, along with longtime companion Eric Roberts and funny man Dave Coulier, died in a car crash. It was a day of national mourning, but the sadness was deeper for Waldo. A series of bad business ventures had left the former millionaire penniless, and in this his darkest hour, he again turned to chemicals to ease his pain. Art Brinkman, Waldo Historian. Well, as most of you know, it, it was at this time in his life that he really bottomed out. Um, now unable to afford more upscale drugs like Coke or crack, he turned to multivitamins of the Flintstones variety. And let me tell you, when the Surgeon General states that a body can only absorb 60% vitamin C, he ain't kidding, buster. Waldo had hit the end of the line. And on February 28, 1999, he checked into a seedy motel in the Lower East Side, planning the worst. Life had built a brick wall of success around Waldo, only to undo it brick by brick until no bricks were left, and Waldo was left brickless. But at the very moment when life had seemed its bleakest, a most unexpected visitor made a dramatic impact on Waldo's life. Danny Bonaducci, star of TV's The Partridge Family and The Danny Bonaducci Show, burst into the room and attempted to wrest the gun from Waldo's hand. Bonaducci had checked into the adjacent room planning to kill himself, but had neglected to purchase ammunition. In the ensuing struggle, Bonaducci was killed. Police rushed to the scene, and the finger for the death of Danny Bonaducci 
was pointed squarely at a pair of Coke bottle glasses. Waldo had done it. A grateful nation rejoiced at Bonaducci's death, and a familiar red pom-pom adored celebrity was once again the toast of the town of a nation. Sober and clean, he is now married with two children and lives in the same Long Island community in which he grew up. Waldo even went back and got his GED. These days, Waldo is happier than ever to be just another face in the crowd.